Hello, everybody. Hope you're, you have enjoyed the keynotes and welcome to this session. Your program is a transpiler, applying compiler design to everyday programming. So, a couple of words about me. Uh, my name is Eduardo Vacchi, and uh, my handle on Twitter is that one on GitHub. You can find me a lot of places with that handle, Evacchi, and it's spelled with CCH because I'm Italian. We like to confuse people with our spelling. So. <laughs> Um, uh, um, so, some things about me, So, about, <laughs> apart from my name. Um, I did some research at the University of Milano in Italy, and uh, mainly in uh, programming language, design, implementation, compilers, interpreters, that type of thing, domain-specific languages. And uh, then I worked at uh, Unicredit, a large bank, you might know it, uh, in the research and development uh, department, uh, in that department, I did a uh, little bit of research on the distributed languages, but mostly I work on a streaming computation engine. And now I'm at Red Hat, where I work uh, with rules, JBPM, and a new fancy project called Cogito that some of you may have heard about already. And uh, rules is a rule engine, JBPM is a workflow engine, and uh, Cogito is kind of taking both rules and JBPM together um, the rule engine is both a language, uh, in a way, because it has its own rule language, and it's also in some, some way a streaming engine, and so there's a bit of languages, there's a bit of streaming engines, and the Cogito takes all of those together and uh, put them in the cloud. So, and it does so by doing some language compilation stuff. Well, if we'll have some time, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So motivation about for this uh, for this talk, uh, you know, I've been in academia for a while, so it kind of stuck with me. And they told, they always told me you always have to start your presentation with motivation. So okay, okay, motivation about this. So my first red uh, task as a red actor was to work on a on a task that nobody else could do or wa wanted to do because it was very boring. There was this legacy piece of code that was uh, used to do marshalling and marshalling, loading and, unload and, and saving of, uh, of files that uh, described uh, a diagram, a flowchart. And this flowchart is, a, is, a, is called a BPM, business process. Um, it's a business process. That's, that's the kind of diagram that we get. And... Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an XML file, and uh, as you know, an XML file, uh, it's a tree representation, while the diagram is a graph. Uh, they started by saying, oh, that's simple. Uh, for that graph representation, we have a data model, and we have a data model for the XML representation. So it's a data mapping problem. But in fact, because the two were a tree and a graph, it's not as simple as saying it's a data mapping problem. So it was a little bit uh, more challenging that, uh, that some people expected. And uh, actually, I started to think, well, maybe I may uh, tackle this problem uh, from a language design, from a language implementation perspective. And that's why I decided that this might be uh, a, a talk that might be of interest for other people. So language implementation in itself is often seen like a dark art, like something that only the magician knows about, so something that only people that do compilers know how to do properly. But in fact, well, uh, it, it, doing a proper compiler is not an easy task, I'm not saying that, but uh, what, I'm, what I want to show you is that actually the design patterns that you use when you design and implement a language could be actually useful for doing so many other things. And uh, so these best practices that you adopt when you design and implement a language could be actually applied to tasks that could be uh, thought of as trivial or, or nothing to do, that they, they, they have nothing to do with, uh, with, with compilers or languages. Moreover, if you learn about how to to implement a compiler, or at least as a, how a compiler works internally, uh, you, could, uh, you could think of your problems from a different angle. So maybe find better solution to solve your problems. And on the other hand, it will give you some insight on some exciting new technologies, such as Quarkus and GraalVM AOT work 
inside. And so it will give you a better picture overall of also new technologies that are becoming more and more relevant. And we're speaking about those in all of these peaks, all of the talks that uh, in fact are currently in this slot. So thank you for coming again. <laughs> There's so much competition. So the goals for today. Um, programs have often a pre-processing phase uh, where you prepare for execution. And then there is actually an execution phase when you actually do the work. So uh, the, idea the idea for today is to learn to recognize and structure this pre-processing phase and so that your whole program can benefit from that. Okay, the title of this talk uh, to lure you in is your program as a transpiler. So the first question you, we, we should ask ourselves is, what's a transpiler, all right? So in order to answer this question, we should uh, first answer another question. What's a compiler? Well, a compiler, it's a, it's a program that translates code that's written in some language, which we call source code, into code that's written in another language, the target language, and that's what we call sometimes the object code. The target language, usually, when, you, when we talk about compilers, it's thought to be at a lower level of abstraction. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so it's, it's a lower level language, like, you know, assembly, bytecode. That's what we think when, when we say compiler. On the other hand, transpiler, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's another word that means uh, some program that translates code uh, written in some language, in the code that's written in another language, but at the same time, the language should be at the same level of abstraction. There's an actual term that it's often used to, to, to indicate transpilers, that it was used before the term transpiler was invented, and it was source-to-source -source translator, because compilers are translators. They translate language to another language. Uh, but it, I guess that it was too long to pronounce source-to-source -source translator, so transpiler, it's, uh, it's quicker, so we all know what a transpiler is today. Okay, but at the same time, I don't really love this word, because um, it, it comes with some, some burden. I, I believe there are some myths uh, that come together with this word, with the word transpiler. We tend to think that uh, transpi I believe that some people tend to think that transpilers are simpler in a way than compilers. First of all, uh, the first myth is that translating from a high-level language to a high-level language is simpler than translating a high-level language into a lower-level language. But actually, a lower level language, because it's lower level, it's much simpler than a high level language. So why is that hard? It is not hard, it's boring. Because uh, the piece of code that you write in a high level language, it gets translated into much more code. But that's the job of the compiler. You don't want to do that. That's why you want to write in a high level language, because it will get translated into so much more code that otherwise you would have to write. So lower level languages are not harder, are actually simple. They're just boring. OK, so some people say, OK, but my transpiler is just the sugaring, syntactic sugar. So it's not on the higher level of abstraction, right? I, I disagree, uh, because the fact that you can the sugar some syntax into more code is actually the same job that a compiler does. And in fact, some more advanced language that support macros, uh, th the macro lets you plug into the compiler of your language and it expands a construct into more code. So in a way, that's a compiler as well. It's a piece of a compiler. The, the third myth is the one that it's more, in, I think, the, the, the more widespread. But a proper compiler should do optimizations. No, uh, that's an optimizing compiler. The, the thing is, most compilers that we use today are also optimizing compilers, so we tend to conflate the two terms, but they're not the same. And in fact, if you think of Java, uh, the, the, the Java compiler is not really an optimizing compiler. It does a few optimizations, but most of the optimization occur at runtime with the JIT, which is another compiler. Okay, so 
pretty much the, the point of this is that distinction is moot. Um, and in fact, uh, writing a good compiler and writing a good transpiler is pretty much the same thing. It's pretty much the same work. So uh, you cannot say, ah, oh, it's a transpiler it's, it's because it's, a, it's just a crappy compiler. It's a, you should do exactly the same amount of work, and it's not that much work, and we'll see that. So how do you write a good compiler? So that's why I should probably entitle this, your program as a compiler. It's the same thing, it's the same thing. So, uh, but the title of the talk is your program as a compiler. So <laughs> what about your program? So what, what can you solve with compiler-like workflows? I believe there are at least two classes of problems that we can, you can solve uh, using compiler-like workflows. Boot time optimization problems, uh, which is kind of those that you solve with Quarkus. Um, Maybe we'll see that later. And the data transformation problems. I want to focus on this one because I think they're a little bit more interesting. So data transformation problem could be a mapping configuration keys into structured data, transforming a Spark job into an execution plan. Let's see, I have a couple of examples now. But um, we will see them in a, in a bit. But I want to uh, use a running example. A running example which is, uh, which will be you know very current because it will be about Function orchestration. So, you are building an immutable dockerized serverless function on Kubernetes in the cloud. And so, what are you doing is that you are connecting your function, which are services, that you are constructing some kind of pipeline or workflow, and you're connecting them together through some sort of channels. Okay? So, you want to be able to describe this workflow and uh, to connect all these pieces together. Okay, there's a problem though. Uh, you might have first some, uh, well, <laughs> there was only the keynotes, but there, were, there, there will be a few talks about uh, serverless and there were during the couple of days before today in the, in the deep types. So uh, one of the problems with function orchestration is that no, there's no standard way to describe function orchestration. Every vendor has its own. So there, there is some effort to standardize, but there's no standard yet that, that everybody uses. So the thing you could do would be to roll your own YAML format, I guess, because YAML is the future, right? So let's roll our own YAML format when you define uh, a workflow with its elements, the start, the function, the end, and the edges that connect those functions. And uh, so, now that you come up with your own solution, congratulations, you, go, you can attend conferences worldwide with your very own uh, serverless workflow description in YAML. There's an alternative solution which is very much boring, but uh, you could actually reuse a standard, which is a, uh, there's a workflow language, and this was the one <laughs> that I was actually working on for the diagram stuff, uh, which is BPM, the Business Process Model Notation. That BPM, and that's uh, exactly what it does. Uh, it, it's a language, it's a description, uh, it's a format that uses XML internally as a serialization format to describe the the flow of, uh, of, of data, in some sense, uh, from one action to another. The problem we choose in BPM is that, unfortunately, nobody today would invite you at their conference to talk about BPM. Nobody in the right mind in a broad selection of talks would actually select someone that is going there, that wants to go there, and talk for a whole hour about BPM. And yet, I am here. <laughs> so, <laughs> the bonuses for actually choosing BPM is that uh, it is a standard, so it is XML-based. That's not the bonus. Uh, we don't really love XML, but who cares? There's a lot of tooling for that. Uh, so you get a lot of, uh, of code generation tools, uh, validation tools, for all for free. So it's all, it's all there. You just have to use it. So uh, that's very cool. Okay, so and then it's a standard, and it's an old standard. That's cool as well because because it's an old standard that it doesn't change that much, and it comes with a lot of features that you can just use. And it, there's also a lot of support from many different vendors for di diagramming, so you can visualize it, and you don't have to write anything. So 
It's all for free. Okay, so, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, that's one. Okay, the goals. Uh, I will use this uh, example, a running example, to show you how we could tackle the problem of reading a BPM and workflow and executing it and also visualizing it uh, using a compiler like technique. Step one recognize your compilation phase. So what's a compilation phase? It's your setup phase. It's the phase where you recognize your inputs, uh, you prepare for doing the, the further execution later. And uh, most importantly, it's a phase that you can do only once and then uh, you can forget about while the execution could go on, on and on and on many times. So it's nice that if you can uh, recognize this phase, because then your execution will be faster, for instance, more efficient. One example, configuring an application. This is really a, a trivial example, right? But uh, think of it. So you load a configuration file, uh, and uh, you don't validate the configuration, uh, the configuration values every single time you read them. So First, you load your file, you validate the file, the, 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 the values that are in there, and, uh, and maybe you map that into a validated data structure. And then at runtime, you will always use the validated data structure. You won't read the file any, every single time. That's not convenient. That's not efficient. OK, another better example, maybe. Um, data transformation pipeline. Suppose you're using Spark. So when you use Spark, you describe a data transformation by, um, by uh, concatenating different operations, map, filter, collect, at the end. So, but, but, but when you do that, you're describing the series of operations that you want to execute, and when you actually execute them, there's, a, there's an execution plan that's being generated. The, execu the generation of the execution plan, that's the compilation phase. It's the phase when we decide where the actual computation will be, will be done, and, uh, uh, and once that's decided, you just execute. OK, so what about BPMN? Uh, if you want to execute a BPMN, first you load the file, and you load the description of your diagram. But because there's a start and an end, and there might be few of them, actually, um, you have to read this, that file into a visitable data structure. So you will have a, a, a starting point, and then you want to go on and visit in depth first or breadth first, whatever, your, your, your graph. Um, OK. And then for each node you encounter, for each task you want or function, you want to execute it. Visualization. Yeah, um, you will still load the file, but then you will display it. So it's not necessary in, in this case that you uh, start from the starting node, for instance, but you would like to lay the nodes out in a way that makes sense. So maybe the strategy is a little different. OK. So for, for reading the BPMN file, as, as we were saying, you can actually use uh, tooling that's already existing. In Java, we have uh, JXP, but uh, you can actually use whatever you want in any other language. So uh, there, there's a lot of libraries for doing XML loading. OK, but now that's the real problem. You, you want to translate from a tree into a graph. Um, so suppose that uh, you have this XML file definition and you have the definition of the edges at the beginning because there's no ordering imposed on the, on the, on the uh, occurrences of the definitions. That's something that you would expect because if, you're, uh, if the file was a YAML file, uh, that will be coded by end, and the users will be free to do whatever they want. In this case, XML is usually done using a tool, but uh, that's just a detail, right? So in this case, we have a problem of forward references. So the, 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 the edges are referring to nodes that are being defined later. Um, this is another example. With the BPMN description, we also have support for describing the layout of the nodes, right? So um, in this case, we have a problem an, uh, of cross-referencing. So the section that comes with, with the, the, the layout could come before or after or 
right in the middle of the nodes. And uh, the references are, are, are all across, are all spread out along the file. So it's not that trivial to map those two. I mean, you will have to do some processing here. How do you carry that out? So my suggestion here is to work like a compiler. So how does a compiler work? In general, a compiler reads a text file and then it parses it into a tree structure, which is called a parse tree. Then the parse tree is transformed into a simpler tree representation, which is called an abstract syntax tree. What's the main difference? Well, uh, some of the minor details of the um, concrete syntax of the, of the file gets dropped because they're not relevant for evaluating. So like white space, who cares about that? Drop it. Uh, and that type of thing. Then the key here is that the AST is further refined through a series of intermediate representations. So you basically get this tree and then you kind of manipulate it many, many times until uh, all the transformations are done and all you uh, end up with is something that can get translated directly into the final representation, which for a compiler would be code, which might be bytecode, assembly, for a transpiler would be a high-level language like JavaScript, and for an interpreter, an interpreter would be execution. Yeah, because most interpreters do all of these steps just as well. So what makes a compiler a proper compiler to me is not being an optimizing compiler, but the idea that you structure the, the evaluation of your language, the evaluation of your problem, um, in compilation phases. You can have as many compilation phases as you, as you want. Uh, those will help you to structure better the, the concerns in your application. Let me give you a few examples here. Um, the configuration file. So you read the file from the class path, you unmarshal the file into a typed object, you sanitize the values that, are, that, that you found, and then you validate those values. And then you coerce those values in, into typed values. This is uh, uh, you know, um, a little bit of a simple example, uh, but uh, just to give you an idea. Another example, data processing and produce a report. So you fetch data from different sources, you discard invalid values, you merge these values into some single data stream, then you compute aggregates and you construct some data structure with all these stats. Then you can uh, render those into a PDF, for instance. Another example, a workflow engine. So you read a BPMN file, you collect the nodes, you collect the edges, and then you prepare for visiting or for laying out. So using compilation phases promotes better separation of concerns, better testability, because now, instead of having one huge uh, evaluation phase, you have several smaller uh, intermediate steps, and you can test each one of them. So if you have fucked up, you do not fuck up uh, the, whole, the, the whole transformation. So you don't have to test just end-to-end. -end. You can also test the smaller steps inside. And uh, you can choose when and where each phase gets evaluated, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Moreover, one bonus is that uh, if uh, for some reason you have more requirements, instead of changing the old phases, you might just add one new. Oh, a uh, distinction that I want to make is phases versus, uh, versus passes. Uh, when I say phases, I indicate something that's logical. You might have many, many phases and only one pass. The phases are logical. It's a way to think of your program. It's a way to think of the concerns that you have in your, in your transformation stages. Uh, but then you could also do several, pass, several phases in, some, in one single pass. Let's see uh, a small example. See, again, the example of reading a config file. It's really simple, but it, it gives you the idea, I believe. So um, I'm reading each value in the config, and then for each value, I sanitize, I validate, and then coerce. But I could do also uh, in a different way. I could first read all the value and sanitize all of them. Uh, then I could validate all of them, and then I could coerce all of them. 
The myth is that doing one pass is generally better than doing uh, than doing many passes. So doing one pa one pass that does many things is generally better than doing many passes, each one doing one single thing. That's, I believe, it's a myth because uh, if you think about it in terms of time, the complexity is basically the same. So don't really, don't really concentrate too much on this. I mean, uh, doing many passes, many many passes versus one single pass. Just structure the program, the program in a way that's uh, simpler. And uh, there, moreover, there are there are cases when doing one single pass it's simply not possible unless you do some kind of uh, workarounds that get nasty and ugly very fast. In this case, we have cross references, we have forward references, and, and also cross references, if you recall. And um, this cannot be resolved without doing several passes, at least two. Okay. So. Suppose we want to evaluate our BPN. How would you, would you carry this out in a, in a compiler fashion? So you will first read the file. Uh, oh, the code is online, so if you want to take a look. Um, you will read the file, you will unmarshal un the file, then you will construct some kind of graph structure, then you will load all of the, the nodes, you will load all of the edges, and then you will construct some visitable structure that it's easy to visit. So uh, it's a graph, but it's a graph that it's well structured for visiting. Um, another workflow, for another, another way, uh, another thing that we want to do with our BPN is display them. So again, as you may notice, most of this hasn't changed. And this, um, this is why uh, I, I say that the structuring by phases is really, is really uh, important, is really cool, because you can actually reuse most of this stuff for doing completely different thing, which is displaying the graph rather than executing it. As you can see, the first is still loading, uh, loading the nodes, loading the edges, extracting the, the data, but in this case, you will get a, a, a data structure that is more suitable to drawing rather than, than, than executing. Just a couple words, how would you do that? Yeah, that's, the, that's visitors. <laughs> it's not really <laughs> something that fancy. It's a pattern that probably you know. Uh, if, you did it, uh, if you did it using, a, uh, like this is Scala, but it, you probably can write it mostly the same way using Kotlin. Um, if you have a language that supports some form of pattern matching, that's pretty, that's pretty obvious and uh, easy to read. Uh, if you're using Java, well, as soon as uh, both the more powerful switch and also record types will land, then you could do that also in Java. So we're pretty much there. Um, yeah, otherwise you have the poor man alternative, which is either the visitor pattern or just doing instant self and cast. But at the end of the day, that's all it does. Okay, so beside doing the visitor pattern, which I guess you know already, uh, the step three is choosing a runtime representation. So the, what is a good runtime run representation if you, in the case you're, you're evaluating your workflow? So the idea here would be to be a Jensen's list, which is basically a map. So for each node, you get all the edges that goes out. And uh, then for each node, you can visit the next nodes. That's pretty simple, right? As for, uh, yeah, that's just the code. We can ignore that. Uh, as for the workflow layout, you don't really need something that's visitable. You don't actually need to visit the nodes in order to draw them. Actually, uh, you probably don't want to do that because of the way a canvas is drawn. First, probably you want to draw the edges and then lay on top of those all the nodes. So it's a different, stra it's a different strategy. Okay. Bonus step four, you can generate the code at compile time. So because we have structured our phases in such a way uh, that uh, the, the, the phases can be moved around, uh, we can at some point decide to, instead of generating a data structure, uh, to generate code that we will then execute at another stage. So we have entirely moved all of our phases from actual runtime of our program to compile time. How would you, how can we do that? Um, yeah. So that's actually uh, the other thing that we can do with compile-like workflows. So boot time optimization problems. 
Okay, I have a smaller example that uh, we move a, a little bit from the BPMN example, just uh, for a parenthesis. Um, so, application wiring. Imagine that we're doing uh, that we're doing uh, uh, dependency injection. So, why are we doing that at runtime each time the application starts? That doesn't make much sense because um, you're doing over and over again the, always the same thing. Um, the, the idea with a dynamic dependency injection was that you could plug stuff around uh, dynamically depending on the providers, but today what we do is we have one single application instance uh, with all of its dependencies packaged package it together, so, and, and we build a Docker out of that, so that, that's nothing more immutable than that. So, okay. You don't really need runtime dependency injection. So I have this uh, small example here. We have uh, an animal, and uh, we want to inject uh, this animal field inside a, an example class. Okay. And then we have uh, I, I I've come up with some inject candidate at the bottom annotation uh, to inject this uh, this an this animal instance uh, of some kind inside of my of my class. Yeah, okay. This is the example a little bit bigger. It's nothing nothing particularly interesting here. It's a really simple example. Okay, uh, so suppose that that's the code you use to bind this. It's uh, vaguely reminiscent of uh, Juice. Um, you have this binder, then you say scan the class but for dependency, and then you create an instance, right? And uh, so if you did this, uh, if you did this at runtime, uh, this is also code that's available. Uh, I'm using the reflections library here. This takes a while. It has to scan all your class but for dependencies, right? And uh, that, depend that, that complexity, uh, the complexity of having to, to scan all the class but is easy to miss. Um, then there's create instance class, uh, method. As you can see, uh, this loop gets executed every time you instantiate uh, uh, an instant, uh, an object. So that's really wasteful. It doesn't really make sense to do this all of, of every single time. Okay, so what we could do instead uh, is to write an annotation processor. The annotation processor will resolve all of those annotations at compile time and uh, then there's nothing mu much that we have to do except executing at runtime. Um, if you do time uh, the two version, reflective and non-reflective, on my machine I got like two seconds for uh, for the reflective uh, for the reflective version because probably had a lot of stuff on the class path and uh, much l lower. Uh, execution time for the for the co-generated version. Uh, mind you, this is not Graal VM. This is Java. Okay, so I'm not using ahead of time compilation. This is just Java, and this is just by moving stuff that's useless from the uh, runtime of your application to the compile time to the build time of your application. And it's not that difficult, really. There's a lot of tooling to do that. Um, and of course. <laughs> If you compile with ahead of time uh, Graal VM, then uh, uh, okay, you get a lot of benefits because <laughs> it's even smaller. So let me give you a couple of words, uh, tell you a couple of words about the project I'm working on right now, which is called Cogito. Um, it's the it's the uh, it's our idea to bring our business automation and the AI platform to the cloud. So we're taking Drews, which is a rule engine, as we're saying, it's a, also a language, and in some sense, it's also a stream processing engine. And uh, JBPM, which is a full workflow platform with its own graphical language, because at the end of the day, that's a language as well. And OptoPlanner, which is a constraint solver, we're bringing them into the cloud. How are we doing that? So I as I was saying, I I'm mostly working on Drews and JBPM, so I will concentrate on that. Uh, so the way we're doing that is by leveraging Quarkus. And I won't spend many words on Quarkus because there are quite a few sessions about that. You've already heard about it, I guess. So the thing is, uh, the key for Quarkus success is not necessarily uh, 
ahead of time compilation. That's really the bonus for you uh, because everything that you can do uh, with the Quarkus extension uh, is available for you for ahead of time compilation, which is both benefits and drawbacks. You have to uh, compare those. Um, so start first, the uh, response time is very low for for ahead of time compilation, and and memory consumption is so tiny compared to JVM. But look, but the the blue bar is JV, JVM execution, and it's so much smaller than the regular the traditional uh, frameworks because it moves to so much of the of the processing from runtime to compile time without any native compilation. That's just code generation. So if you want to, uh, to know more about Cogito, there's also the Quercus extension. And that's where uh, we do the things that I'm going to show you. So Paul, as I was telling you, Drews and JBPM have their own languages. In the case of JBPM, we've been seeing that for the whole presentation, it's a graphical language. At the top, we have Drews, which has an actual textual language. That's a description of a rule. So what we did, uh, previously we were loading these files at runtime, process them, and then execute them. But uh, that took time. It takes the startup time, it need, you need to scan the class path for the resources, and so on and so forth. So that takes quite a while. And we sat and said, OK, but why do we have to do that every single time? Uh, why do we have to parse Drews every single time and interpret the, uh, the constraints and then evaluate the consequence every single time? Can we do something smarter? Yes, we can. And that's why in rules there's, a, there's this uh, model, this, represent, this, this uh, internal representation that we uh, now generate and uh, a compile time that we now, uh, so that we now can avoid loading DRL files, rules, rule uh, language, DRL. Uh, we can avoid loading those files every single time because we have now compiled class files. We don't have to parse anything. The code is there. We can just execute it. And the same for JBPM. So the magic behind Cogito, and it's the same magic behind uh, all of the powerful Quercus extension. All the all the thing all the things uh, all the uh, what Quercus extension do is generating code at compile time, so they don't have to do bo uh, boring stuff or useless stuff at runtime. And by doing that, they can also drop a lot of dependencies that are not necessary. Do I need an XML file reader at runtime if it's only for configuration? No, if I can move configuration parsing at compile time. That's how Hibernate works, for instance, the Quarkus extension for Hibernate. That's how you get so much smaller start of time, both in JVM mode and in uh, native mode. At the top, you can see an example with JVPM, and at the bottom, uh, it's for, for Drews, uh, back when the Cogito project will call, was called the Submarine. Yes, that's a tiny uh, Easter egg. So, OK, conclusion. Do your processing in phases. It's cheap. You can do that, and it brings you a lot of value, a lot of benefits. And especially, try to do more and more in the pre-processing phase of your program, uh, your compile time, so to speak, so that you have to do less in your runtime, so that your runtime will be uh, lighter and your execution will be better, will be more efficient, more fast even, because it will do less. There's nothing faster than doing nothing. In other words, separate what you can do once from what you can have to do repeatedly. And if you can, you can also move some or all of your phases to compile time to get even more performance. OK, here's a few links. Uh, the a link to the previous part of this talk, which is actually uh, the tiny part about uh, boot time optimization. If you want to see the full version is online, there's the full source code there of this, uh, of this, uh, of this talk. And there's the link for Cogito, Quarkus, and uh, an interesting book that's being written, not by me, uh, Crafting Interpreters, that will give you even more insights on how to write interpreters, which is really, really cool. So that's all I have.
Are there any questions? We have 10 minutes. Besides, uh, where's the food? <laughs> okay, uh, you can meet me around. I'll be around at the conference and uh, also at that Reddit booth. Come and see us and talk to us about Cogito, compilers, whatever. See you. Thank <laughs> you.